Uh, thank you for joining us on this relatively chilly Hong Kong evening to um, follow John Thompson with his camera through China. And we are going to be very ably led on this journey by Richard Ovenden, who is the Bodley's librarian from the Bodleian Libraries, the University of Oxford. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Louise Jones. I'm the university librarian at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And the university library is holding an exhibition Hong Kong through the lens of John Thompson. And we were absolutely delighted when Richard, um, who is an expert in this area, as well as being an expert librarian, um, agreed to speak as part of the exhibition. Uh, if you haven't seen the exhibition, it's actually at the Chinese University of Hong Kong Library. You're more than welcome to come and have a look. And there are some leaflets at the back that, that tell you more about it. And I'm going to shamelessly plug two other events um, connected with the exhibition. On, on the 10th of January at 4.30 um, in the afternoon, we have a talk by Betty Yao, who actually um, was the driving force behind the John Thompson exhibition. Um, and she will be talking about the history of the collection and how the collection actually survived through the years. That talk is going to be in Cantonese, but you're very welcome to join us. And then on the 25th of January, um, all afternoon, we have a workshop on wet collodion photography processes, which is the process that John Thompson used. And we are we are delighted that uh, Stephen Jung, uh, a, a very professional photographer, is going to take us through the processes that were used to create these amazing photos. Um, so all of these events, the exhibition and the other workshops are going to be held at the library on uh, the CU campus in Sha Tin. Um, and if you want to register for the events, please do so through the University Library's website. But um, back to tonight, and I would like to just briefly introduce Richard. Richard is Bodley's librarian, and he is the, own, he is the 25th Bodley librarian in 418 years. So yeah, <laughs> if you do the maths, it's pretty amazing. Um, uh, he has a, a very distinguished career as a librarian. He has worked at the Durham University Library, the House of Lords Library, the National Library of Scotland, where he actually, I think, curated a John Thompson exhibition, um, the University of Edinburgh. And since 2003, he has been at the Bodleian Libraries, first as keeper of special collections and then as deputy librarian. And then from 2014, he has been Bodley's librarian. He is a prominent member of Research Libraries UK, the Consortium of European Research Libraries, and is currently president of the Digital Preservation Coalition. He's a fellow of the Society of Antiquities, Antiquaries, sorry, and he was elected to the American Philosophical Society in 2015, and he holds a, a professor, professorial fellowship at Balliol, Balliol College, Oxford. So he's, he's very clearly a renowned and highly respected uh, librarian, as I know. Uh, uh, but, but tonight he is going to talk about his other passion, which is the history of photography, and in particular, John Thompson, who is really, um, Richard describes as one of the most crucial innovators in the art of photography. So Richard, over to you. But briefly, before we start, we have a small souvenir for you. So we have lots of posters of the exhibition, and Richard was delighted to see the little full <laughs> label. <laughs> so it's a it's a copy of the poster. Thank You're welcome, Thank Richard. Thank you very much. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for um, your warm applause, and especially to Louise for that very very generous uh, introduction. I'd like to commend the exhibition, which. Um, the Chinese University of Hong Kong Library have put on, um, uh, and part of the reason why I'm here speaking to you is to coincide with that wonderful exhibition, which pairs um, reproductions of Thompson's or original photographs with um, contemporary photography 
taken by Ed Stokes of the same scenes as they are today. So it's a really stunning and very, very interesting exhibition and uh, it's well worth um, a visit. And I'd also like to commend both Betty's talk as she has been such a powerful advocate for John Thompson's kind of re rediscovery uh, across Asia and indeed in Europe. Um, and also Stephen's um, workshop, because um, part of the reason why Thompson's work is so compelling is because of the process he used and many other photographers in the 19th century used. And this is a wonderful opportunity to see a contemporary practitioner use that 19th century process. And you can see in the exhibition some of his work, which is really strikingly uh, beautiful and interesting. So please do attend that as well. So, as Louise said, um, I have um, an interest in John Thompson for many years, and in fact, I did a big project while I was working in the National Library of Scotland. Um, I, I had never heard of John Thompson until I became a curator there and discovered, actually through his printed publications, um, which he published in his lifetime, uh, mostly about China, um, and, and saw what a remarkable individual he was, not just for the photographs themselves, but because of the journeys that he made. And so there were a series of photographic journeys he made in Asia, and then actually again in Europe, which I think are remarkable in the history of photography. Um, and because of the, the body of work itself that uh, he accumulated, um, which has really stood the test of time. And um, I, we put on an exhibition and we actually had the penultimate governor of Hong Kong come and open it. And um, this was back in 1997. And uh, it then toured uh, around Europe. And I, I think I myself didn't realize the, um, you know, the momentous things that were about to happen to Hong Kong and how it might give an opportunity to reflect somewhat differently on Thompson's uh, time here in the city of Hong Kong and um, his time in China. And, and in fact, over the past 30 years, there have been actually a number of books, a number of people have gone back to Thompson's work and uh, interpreted it anew. And I think mostly his work um, in China and he's as a result become really a, a major figure in the history of photography and that's also been reflected in the price of his work certainly since the time when I was a curator hunting for those rare um, materials that survive um, of his publications they've uh, I wish I'd bought them myself at the time because they've increased in value absolutely uh, phenomenally um, and, and indeed, in China itself, he's also, you know, really become recognized as being a, a very interesting and important uh, documenter of 19th century China. But who was um, this extraordinary man? Well, he was, he began his life in Edinburgh, the city where I worked and rediscovered him um, in the immediate post enlightenment um, phase. And Edinburgh at the time was a very buoyant city. It had gone through this period in the long 18th century of intellectual ferment, where we had great figures like Adam Smith and David Hume centered around the University of Edinburgh, who really changed the way that we think about the world and ushered in a scientific enlightenment that was really kicking in in the 19th century, again, based around uh, the University of Edinburgh. Um, Charles Darwin was a student there, for example. And um, science was absolutely the centre of what made Edinburgh a special city in the 19th century. And photography came actually very early to, to Edinburgh. Um, in uh, William Henry Fox Talbot, the inventor of photography, or at least one of the, 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 the process which became established as the fundamental process in photography was developed by an Englishman called William Henry Fox Talbot, who had strong family connections to Edinburgh and close intellectual connections with some of the scientific um, uh, leaders in the Scottish universities. And the, 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 the new art and science of photography became established very early on. And there were two important practitioners, David Octavius Hill and Robert Adamson, who made a very important series of photographs in Edinburgh during the 1840s, immediately after the 
announcement of photography's invention in 1839. And this is one of their photographs taken of the Scott Monument in Princes Street in 1844. And so it was in this world in 1837 that John Thompson was born and grew up with photography beginning to happen in a significant way in the city of his birth. And he was actually born to, um, in humble origins, his father was a tobacconist and he um, was soon um, apprenticed as a, as a young boy really to this man, James Mackay Bryson, who was a scientific instrument maker. So there was this whole industry around the University of Edinburgh and the scientists there who were making the equipment that, that was being used to develop um, um, contemporary science. And Thompson, uh, and this man, James Mackay Bryson, was the son of another scientific instrument maker called Robert Bryson, who was the clockmaker to Queen Victoria. And so this was an, uh, a great opportunity for him as a young man because he was in this scientific uh, milieu. Um, and at the time, although his family was not, um, he was not well educated enough as a, as a child and his family were not wealthy enough to send him to Edinburgh University, he had an opportunity. And that is through this man who was called Sir David Brewster, who was one of the leading scientists in Edinburgh, who... Um, established the Watt Institution and School of Arts. And that was a mechanics institute which educated young men, and it was only men initially, um, as, as at evening classes. So people like John Thompson, who enrolled in the school, could work during the day and attend the evening classes to improve themselves. And this sense of self-improvement was very prominent in 19th century Edinburgh. And the Watt Institution, which is still in existence today as Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, um, was an absolutely critical institution. And this man, David Brewster, was its director. And he was very closely acquainted with all of the photographers like William Henry Fox Talbot and Hillen Adamson. And Thompson attended the Watt Institution and School of Arts, age 19, uh, between 1856 and 58, studying, studying natural philosophy, chemistry and mathematics and getting a prize in English. And I think this is an important fact to hold on to. But we know of Thompson's work through the survival of an archive. And the archive is in two parts. And I want to make a plug for libraries and archives as preserving the past so that we can understand how we got to where we are and hopefully where we're going next. And the, important of that, the importance of that role is um, that libraries and archives play seen through the survival of Thompson's work. So the archive is in two parts. Firstly, there is a, an archive of his actual photographs. So these are negatives. There are almost 2,000 of them. They're glass plate negatives with, which survive in a series of wooden packing crates, which were lined with lead which he made in Asia to help him on his journeys and which accompanied him back um, to London um, uh, after he finished his time in Hong Kong in 1872. And the second element of his archive um, is a collection of printed works. And the printed works um, I'll come on to uh, towards the end of my presentation. And so those printed publications are uh, um, the, really the main way in which, at the time, Thompson's work was appreciated. And what's in those packing crates, which are today found in a library called the Wellcome Institute for the History of Medicine in London, uh, look like this. So they're physically absolutely fascinating objects. They're heavy glass plate. They are covered with a, a, a solution which is called collodion, which holds um, uh, a silver solution which, which reacts to light, which makes it photographic. Um, and you can see how they've suffered over the ages. Those scratches, the little um, paper labels on them, which Thompson put on to identify each image. Um, they have this wonderful sense of having traveled through space and time. And what the um, the Wellcome Institute have done, and what I did when I did my exhibition, is to make uh, modern prints from them. So that's what that negative 
looks like when it's turned into a positive. This is um, uh, Queen's Road here in Hong Kong. Um, as you'll see when you go to the exhibition at the Chinese University, it's pretty unrecognizable today. Um, and, and the process that you see he, here um, creating an image was incredibly cumbersome. I'm not going, going to go into a lot of detail. You need to go to Stephen Chung's uh, workshop to see it in practice. But it involved taking glass plates, coating them with this solution, um, which you had to make up on the spot. You then put it in the back of a camera while it's still tacky to expose the image and then allow the plate to dry, and then you take it back to your studio and make a positive print from it. So it's a very cumbersome and slow process. You have to lug all of this material with you wherever you're going, um, it, including into um, on, on the long journeys that John Thompson made. Um, and the fact that these negatives survive at all is miraculous. I can't think of another 19th century photographer for who we have such a, uh, a large corpus of material. And the archive today is represented very, very well in digital form on the Wellcome Institute's website. And I'm going to do nothing more than just to point, point this resource out to you because you'll find an absolute wealth of material um, online. And I think one of the great ironies is that these are, images are all free to download. And John Thompson would have hated it because he was a commercial photographer who made his money by selling his photographs and commercially distributing them in the form of printed books. And so he would have found this very, very hard to understand. So his time in Asia began with a period of boredom. It didn't quite begin immediately with boredom, but um, he traveled out to follow his brother um, who had jumped on a boat to the newly founded um, British colony of Singapore to establish himself as a watchmaker. And um, John Thompson uh, uh, followed him um, in 1862. And in June of that year, he advertised his services as a photographer. So exactly how he learned photography back in Edinburgh, we don't know, but it must have been through some combination of his time at the Watt Institution and working for, for the Brysons. Um, but in 1862, although he's established himself as a photographer, he didn't make many images, very, very few of them survive. And by 1863, he's advertising himself in the Straits time as part of Thompson Brothers, chronometer, optical and nautical instrument maker. So he's having to diversify um, already. Um, and he later recalled, perhaps through rose-tinted spectacles, that he was chiefly engaged in photography, a congenial, profitable, and instructive occupation, enabling me to gratify my taste for travel and to fill my portfolio. But what we also find reading his own accounts is that he did get bored. And I think that's because of the economic slump which happened in Singapore in the 1860s. There wasn't enough business for him, and so he was forced to occupy his time by reading. And so one of the things I want to emphasize to you this evening is that the 19th century is a world which exists partly in print. And so the importance of the printed page, printed publications, the emergence of newspapers, the emergence of illustrated magazines, this was a very, very powerful um, world in which the newly educated um, sort of working classes were able to access information that was becoming cheaper and cheaper for them to acquire. And there were also, guess what, libraries becoming increasingly available, um, including in Singapore, where John Thompson had available to him the Raffles Lending Library and the Library of the Straits Branch of the Royal Asiatic Society. And although I don't know exactly whether this was where he found a particular book, which these illustrations come from, but he read uh, a Frenchman's account of his travels to um, the ruins of Angkor Wat in Cambodia, which in its English translation, which was almost certainly what Thompson read, was called Travels in Siam, Cambodia and Laos, 1858 to 61. And Thompson 
remembers Reed being inspired by reading it to travel to the ruined cities that the author found in the heart of the Cambodian forest. And this was the first of his photographic journeys. He traveled to Siam at first, a five-day steamer trip from Singapore, and was presented to the court of King Mongkut in 1865. And he also met another Scotsman. So this is another feature which we'll come back to, particularly when we get to Hong Kong, a man called H.G. Kennedy in the British consulate there. And he took this superb photograph of the King of Siam state barge, um, and he recalled very vividly arriving in Bangkok, the floating city in the dimness of the early morning light, uh, and he gazed upon the towers and roofs of more than half a hundred temples. So that English literature training stood him well. Um, but again, that image, he actually became famous because of this, which is the reproduction of that photograph in wood engraving in the Illustrated London News. So his photograph got sent back to London, translated because the technology didn't exist at that time to mass produce the photographic image but skilled wood engravers could translate it into wood engraving which meant that thousands and thousands of copies of the illustrated london news could be printed and sold with john thompson's photograph and his credit line and he took some other he began you begin to see his kind of the range of his work there are portraits of different classes of people from um, one of the oarsmen on the King's State Barge to the King himself. And this is, is we, we now sometimes think of this man in the personage of Yul Brynner. For those of you who know the film of the stage adaptation of a play called The King and I, which was itself based on a contemporary account by King Monkut's American governess of his children called Anna Leon Owens. And Anna was there when John Thompson visited. And in her account, which became The King and I, um, she refers to him as James Thompson, the able English photographer. And again, John would have been horrified of being called an English photographer. But through the good offices of King Monk, who he, he established quite a, re, uh, a strong relationship with and with other members of the court, he was given um, passage um, with letters of passage and in um, the ability to travel on elephants to um, Angkor. And he was the first photographer to visit Angkor. He, he beat a Frenchman called Henri Gel by just a few days. And his account of traveling there is absolutely remarkable, um, uh, slightly hair-raising uh, account. But they're uh, an extraordinary body of material, some of them very, very striking uh, in the way they look um, to uh, uh, an eye trained to with, with kind of modern photography in mind. But they are also very important documents for archaeologists and heritage professionals. And I, when I was doing my research, I had a lot to do with the World Monuments Fund uh, team of archaeologists who were there in Angkor Wat um, and using Thompson's photographs to help um, the preservation of the structures there. Um, and on the way back, he traveled uh, through a different route. He went to Cambodia and here photographed King Norodom um, in Phnom Penh um, and uh, traveled back to um, Singapore and then to the UK in June 1866 and began to show um, his, his Angkor images, ones like this, to everywhere he could, in Edinburgh and in London. He gave um, papers to the Ethnological Society of London, to the Royal Geographical Society, and to the British Association for the Advancement of Science. And became, he became quite a sensation to the kind of uh, intellectual classes in, in Britain at the time. And he was elected a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society in November 1866, which was not bad from the, for the son of a tobacconist in Edinburgh. Um, so this was you know, photography, enable, photography and travel enabling him to kind of climb the social ladder. And he began to promote his work through publications um, and uh, exhibitions. And uh, I'll come on to, uh, we'll, we'll come and kind of look at that aspect, aspect of his uh, kind of commercial practice um, in a little while. But let's go back. 
Um, so um, he returns in 1867 to Asia, first to Vietnam, and then to Singapore, where he packs up his studio, leaves his brother behind, and moves his studio to Hong Kong. And uh, he did this in early 1866, uh, sorry, 1868, the Hong Kong Daily Press in February of that year reporting that Thompson was in Saigon, but about to arrive on the next ship carrying French mail. And in the 11th of March, the China Mail advertised portraits by Mr. J. Thompson, who is prepared to take portraits, views, and other photographs in his rooms, commercial bank buildings, Queens Road, Hong Kong. Um, but very soon afterwards, he moved to 29 Queens Road, next door to Messrs. Lane, Crawford and Company. And I only recently discovered that Mr. Lane and Mr. Crawford were both, guess what, Scotsmen. So I think there's a clue to the kind of co-location of businesses there. Um, so I don't need to tell this audience that Hong Kong had become uh, a, a British colony, a colony just uh, a few decades before, and it so become a major trading entrepot. The population grew fast by 1871 with over 125,000 people living there, and it was really the right place at the right time for John Thompson. Um, and I think the, the quantity of his fellow Scotsmen well, may well have been a factor. I found a wonderful report in 1867, just before Thompson arrived, in a, a satirical magazine called The China Punch, which reported about 100 Scotchmen and their friends sat down to dinner at the club in, on Saturday. Hotchpotch, haggis, cocky leaky were included in the bill of fare, and after good justice being done to them, Willie brewed a peck of malt, and the company settled themselves firmly into making a night of it after the approved Scotch fashion. And for anyone who's ever lived in Edinburgh, believe me, that's a serious, um, that's a serious event. And this uh, is one of his first photographs that he took um, of uh, Hong Kong Harbor. And um, this image you will see blown up very large and absolutely striking in the exhibition in the Chinese uh, uh, University Library. And um, it, the, the quantity of data in the collodion photographs is absolutely stunning. So they bear being blown up very large. Some of the photo historian purists would prefer just to have the originals, um, but I, I think that you gain such a lot from seeing them enlarged to, uh, to a great size, and you can really see the detail that the collodion process captures. Um, but this is what the um, original photographs look like. This is from an album in the Bibliothèque Nationale, um, which includes a number of John Thompson photographs. And the prints are made through a 19th century process called the albumin process, which um, uses egg white as a carrier for um, uh, a silver uh, light sensitive solution, which was used to print the positives as uh, contact prints from the original negatives. And here we see um, the prior of Hong Kong. And Thompson was making these prints in his studio um, uh, on Queens Road for sale to not only to the, mostly to the Westerners who were living and working in Hong Kong, but also to many travelers who were passing through Hong Kong and would assemble photographs on their journeys. They would end up in Australia and, and, and sometimes then back in the US. And you see in lots of the albums in collections in the United States, almost the journeys that these travelers took and uh, photographs accumulated on each of their stops and put into albums um, like this one. Um, Thompson said, Hong Kong was once said to be the grave of Europeans, but now with its city of Victoria, its splendid public buildings, parks and gardens, its docks, factories, telegraphs and fleets of steamers, it may be fairly considered the birthplace of a new era in Eastern civilization. Um, and, and here again, we see Thompson's range. He's always interested in people. And I think he had a fantastic rapport with people. And you see it in his commentary with many of his photographs where um, for a Westerner to get the kind of access to 
uh, Chinese people at the time must have been very, very difficult. They must have been very suspicious of him. And, um, but he, had, uh, he must have had a certain charisma and, and personal charm which gave him some of this access um, to people. And he had a genuine concern and interest for the welfare of people of all social classes. And of course, you've got to remember that he was a working class uh, person um, himself. Um, this, uh, the text that goes along with this image um, describes the sitter as an old woman who still busies herself in the lighter domestic duties. She is skillful with her needle and invaluable as a nurse in times of sickness. Her hair is grown thin and white, but she still dresses it with neatness and care. So he's very interested in their, their kind of personal circumstances. Um, this is a photograph of Walung and Kumwo shop, which was very close to, to Queen's Road. And um, you can imagine that Thompson must have known these, um, uh, the people who ran the shop because he would have been passing them every day. And so you can imagine him building up enough of a rapport to be comfortable, for them to be comfortable with him uh, taking their photograph. Uh, happy to pose for him. So this is one of the 19th century originals. And this is all that remains of the original negative back in the Wellcome Institute in London. Um, in 1869, uh, Her Majesty's ship Galatea visited Hong Kong with His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh on board. And this was a major event for the city and the streets were decorated to celebrate the royal visit to this far-flung part of the empire. And Thompson documented the visit photographically. This is a, a Chinese street scene prepared for illumination, is the caption. And it was part of a series of photographs that he published with a local Hong Kong uh, uh, a publisher called Norona, who assembled a book of text and images with original photographs pasted in, because again, at, the moment, at that time, 1869, there wasn't the technology to reproduce photographs in ink. Um, so there were small print runs. The book is now quite rare, um, but the profits went to the building of St. John's Cathedral. Um, and this is a... a uh, another of the images that appear in that book, Hong Kong Harbour, taken again in 1869. But he also was experimenting with the stereoscopic process. And there was a great boom in stereo images um, in the 19th century. And he had a stereo camera. So these, although this is blown up in my slide, um, the actual originals are, are much, much smaller. And so, um, and this is Happy Valley. And so he's interested in documenting the whole of what he had access to, the, the landscape, um, individuals, but also the kind of domestic scenes. So this is uh, a family drinking in a tea house in Hong Kong, taken in uh, at probably 1870. Um, and again, being able to get access to a very kind of uh, intimate scene like this um, would have required... Um, very considerable personal skills. His first photographic journey into China was uh, relatively local up the North River, and this is uh, entitled The Temple of the 500 Gods Canton. And here you can see Thompson really at the height of his powers, playing with light and darkness, and really kind of invoking the atmosphere of the, the building that he saw uh, photographically. Very, very powerful. This is from uh, a vintage print um, um, in, uh, I think, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Um, here's another photograph from the, uh, a positive take, a modern positive taken from the negative. Um, and these images were published in a book called Views on the North River, also published in Hong Kong, this time in 1870, a very rare book. Um, there's only one in the UK, one I was able to buy for the National Library of Scotland while I was doing this um, exhibition. And again, in, in Canton, he was photographing street gamblers. And this wonderful, I think this is one of my favorite images, which could have been taken five years ago, 50 years ago, as well as um, uh, over, uh, you know, um, over a century ago. And um, 
extraordinary sort of power to present the individual as, as an individual. And then um, this image appears in uh, one of his books. It's called The Fruits of China. And so he's trying to sort of convey the, the kind of richness of, the, um, of the, 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 the land, the country that he finds himself in. But I think he must have had access to this photograph taken by really the most famous photographer of the um, 1860s, Roger Fenton, who, who back in London took this photograph. And I think possibly Thompson may have seen it when he was back between uh, the Cambodian uh, trip and moving back to, to Hong Kong. So I think there's definite homage between, from Thompson to Fenton here. Um, his third journey was to um, Taiwan. And he stopped on the way in Amoy. Um, and in the, he was in the company of, guess what, another Scotsman, James Laidlaw Maxwell, who ran the Mission Hospital in Taiwan Fu and was also from Edinburgh and a graduate of Edinburgh University. And this, of course, he's photographing uh, foot binding, uh, one of a series of photographs he took. And his, his account, he describes the patients which he um, used to get the, uh, the woman whose foot he was able to photograph to be comfortable enough, which was a very, you know, was not a common occurrence. Um, to, to actually reveal this very kind of intimate uh, detail. And um, I think he's, his charm and persuasion was, was really needed in order to um, take this photograph. And he, interestingly, in the text that accompanies it, he draws a parallel between foot binding and the way which he described Western women using corsets to... Um, distort their body shape, um, which he describes as ridiculous. And I think that's quite an interesting kind of observation to make. Um, and he, he was interested, this is a, a merchant mandarin. Um, so again, different classes. He was trying to convey the kind of the range of the people and the land in which he was, he was visiting. This is one of his most uh, famous uh, images taken on uh, what I would call his fourth journey, which is up the Min River to Fuxiao. And it's called the Island P Pagoda, taken on the Min River. Um, and this is an image from one of the permanent photographic processes, which one of his books used to make this image. This is a carbon print, which is now a very now a now very obscure process, very, very difficult to use but renders the image permanent. So at the time, um, <coughs> photography was racked with the uh, fading of many of the images that were taken. And photography constantly innovated to make it possible to reproduce images in permanent processes. And the, the holy grail was to print images in ink. And we'll come to that in a moment. But this uh, carbon process allowed very strong tonal uh, tones to be reproduced uh, with a wide tonal range and this very, very striking image. And um, this was taken on a trip in 1870, and he met in Fuchao uh, the Reverend Justice Doolittle, and, um, who was an American missionary and uh, who published a work called The Vocabulary and Handbook of the Chinese Language, which John Thompson published an appendix on photographic chemicals and apparatus. So he was able to, to translate the whole process into Chinese. Um, but this is what the glass plate looks like now. And so again, you can see the ravages of time that's taken on the emulsion, which is cracked. But more importantly, the way in which the process um, of making the carbon print required the printers to mask off the image and the, the kind of damage that they did to the uh, original negative. And we can see that materiality, which I really actually like. I think it makes it very powerful. It conveys the age of the image very well. Um, in this uh, photograph, this is a, a, another modern print taken from a negative. And you can see here that um, it's cracked in two. And um, this is called the Chow Chow Fu Bridge, and it appears as 
a plate in volume two of his great epic publication, Illustrations of China and Its People. And the image was taken just outside Shantou, known to Thompson as Swatow, um, in 1869. And he records, when taking the illustration, I endeavored to avoid the crowd by starting to work at daylight, but the people were astir and seeing my strange instrument, instrument pointed cannon-wise towards their shaky dwellings, they at once decided I was practicing some outlandish witchcraft against the old bridge and its inhabitants. The roughs and market people came heart and soul to the task, armed with mud and missiles, which were soon flying in a shower about my head. And so what he was doing was actually hiding behind his tripod, which had this glass plate in it, which had had the image exposed. And one of the bricks hit his camera and broke the glass plate while just after the image had been taken. But the process engravers at the Autotype Company back in London a few years later were able to very skillfully edit out. You can just see a line of the crack. Um, and so it appears as if there was no, no damage there at all. Uh, journey five uh, by John Thompson was to Beijing. And this happened uh, between September 1871 and January 1872. Um, he was fascinated by the Ming tombs. Um, uh, this astonishing mausolea of the um, of 13 emperors, 13 of the Ming emperors. Um, this one, the tomb of Yung Lo, and you can see other animals leading backwards. And he took a number of very um, memorable photographs. But again, he was interested in people, um, uh, and in particular, the, this um, Manchu bride in her in her bridal gear. Uh, again, a very, very intimate portrait, a very kind of modern looking um, portrait. Um, and here you can see the backdrop that he must have brought with him, where he took his photographs of people's kind of placed up against uh, the backdrop. And you can imagine him carrying all this material with him um, on these very, very long journeys. Uh, a Manchu woman. And again, you know, the rear view, a very unusual view for a 19th century photographer to take. But I think interested in her, the, the mode of her, of her headdress. And a night watchman. Um, and very, you can see a very similar in London, there's a series called The Cries of London, where there are kind of the street people are depicted. And this very much reminds me I wonder if Thompson had seen the series of prints called The Cries of London. But he describes, there's one passage where he describes the challenges of taking photographs in a very busy city like Beijing. Once, as I threaded my way along, I had to climb a pile of wooden planks to reach the path beyond. And finding a clear view could be attained from the top of a fine shop on the other side of the road. I had my camera set up and proceeded to take a photograph. But in two or three minutes before the picture could be secured, there was a sudden transformation of the scene. Every available spot of ground was taken up by eager but good-natured spectators. Traffic was suspended. And just as I was about to expose the plate, some ingenious youth displaced the plank on which I stood and brought me down in a rapid, undignified descent, immensely entertaining the crowd. His final journey in China was up the Yangtze. Um, in February 1872, he finally reached um, Wushan in Sichuan province, some 12,000 miles uh, west of Shanghai. And uh, this is actually a plate from his work, his great work, his epic work, The Illustrations of China and Its People. And this is another one of the the plates from that series, uh, from that publication. Um, and he photographed the, the, the three gorges at, in Wushan and returned via Shanghai to Hankou and Nanjing. And in, in each place that he stopped, he set up a studio, almost like a pop-up studio. And he would sell prints, he would make some prints from his negatives and sell them, I think to keep the cash flow so that he could keep moving on his journey. So that kind of constant eye to the commercial opportunity to keep him on the go, 
always building up this incredible stock, this incredible portfolio of images that he knew would make his fortune back um, in, in London. Um, I'm just going to very touch very briefly on um, another journey. This is Journey 7 in Cyprus, which he visited in 1878, making a very uh, uh, lavish book. Um, and what I think of as his final journey, actually into the heart of London. And I'll come back to this in a moment, but there's a very pioneering set of street pho photographs, um, generally regarded as the first social documentary photography published in a series called Street Life in London. And so, again, he's, you see the same approach to the kinds of people who had a life on the street that he saw in China, here replicated in um, the heart of the empire itself. And uh, this is a very famous image called Hooky Alf of White in Whitechapel outside a pub. And again, he must have exercised the same skills to, um, because this is not candid photography. He's got a tripod. It's a big, cumbersome, obvious uh, equipment that he's using. And he could not have done that, taken that image surreptitiously. He would have had to have commanded the attention and the confidence and the respect of the people who he's photographing in this image. And I think the fact that he came from a working class background must have given him some um, ability, some empathy. And you certainly see that um, um, in the project. And I'll talk about, about that in a moment. But I want to... Um, end by talking a little bit about this idea of print culture. And so we think of photographs today through Instagram, through Flickr, through social media, um, and that's how the majority of the photographic images that we see are um, disseminated. And we're saturated by the photographic image. But go, travel back to the second half of the 19th century, and the way in which you appreciated photographs was not by going uh, online, obviously, or indeed by going into an exhibition gallery and seeing an exhibition of photographs. You saw them through the medium of print, and you saw them in bookshops, you saw them in libraries. There were there's a great um, flourishing of circulating libraries, libraries that you know, working class people could have access to, as well as books becoming cheaper, um, particularly in the form of illustrated magazines. And uh, they were much more in reach of um, a wide population who were becoming increasingly literate as the 19th century progressed. And we see that through Thompson's engagement with this world of print culture. And this was his first book, um, the book of his images from Angkor Wat. And again, he's, he's advertising it illustrated by photographs. So this is the, the sense that the photographs are taken on the spot. He was actually there. And this idea of the veracity of the photographic image, the camera cannot lie. We know that, don't we? Um, and this was established um, in the 19th century by people like John Thompson. This one is uh, published in Edinburgh, the town of his birth. He must have had access to that the publishing community there. Um, it's a relatively rare book, and it's partly rare because it had a small print run, probably 500 copies at most, because it, the technology used was to actually get prints made from Thompson's negative and to physically stick them into the book itself. So imagine how laborious that is for um, any size of print run. So they kept the print run small. They're relatively expensive. Um, but you do find them in, in serious libraries. And that it was a, a, a significant publication. It was well reviewed in kind of learned publications. And this one um, is a panorama. He must have climbed quite high up the ruins. You imagine the kind of the heat and humidity. Um, and it's just simply photographs just stuck together rather crudely. It doesn't quite join. He isn't quite able to make a kind of neat panorama, but he's doing the best he can with the available technology. Um, so by the time we come to 1876, uh, sorry, 1873 and 74, um, he's come back from Hong Kong in 18, 
1872, he's packed his studio up. He's left a few negatives uh, behind, which he sells to a Chinese photographer, um, wh which get reused, reprinted um, for many years afterwards. But he takes the bulk of them back to London, and he um, makes a deal with a London publisher called Samson Lowe, Marston Searle and Rivington, who were a major public publisher of travel accounts and art books um, for a class of what I call the armchair travelers of Victorian England. And these are quite large format books. Um, there were four volumes. Um, they first appear, the first volume appears in 1873, and there are um, 750 copies made of this, but it's made using a revolutionary new process which allows the photograph to be printed in ink. So it solves that, pro that problem of permanence. It means that the photographs don't have to be stuck in by hand. They're all mechanically produced, but very, very high quality using a process called the collar type, which is a, 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 a kind of photographic version of lithography. And... Um, you, can, you, you must print it on a coated um, paper so it has a kind of glossy finish and um, it has an amazing tonal range. So the, the images look very, very striking today. They don't suffer from that fading um, and they capture a great deal of detail as well. You get quite um, fine detail uh, reproduced. And you can just see the kind of the sheen that the, the coated paper um, and the ink on it produces. And it also enables you to kind of assemble uh, quite easily a number of photographs on a single page. Um, here's some more taken in Hong Kong um, and different sizes. So it was very kind of innovative. It was very striking at the time. The reviewers were amazed at how, um, how faithful the reproductions were, how what high quality the, the images were at the time. And again, experimenting with graphic design, the appearance of the images on the page, very, very innovative. And again, you can see that, um, you can see that kind of sheen. And these are some of the images of the um, uh, members of the Imperial Court um, and the uh, governing uh, class in, in, in Beijing and then down to the Summer Palace, uh, the Bronze Temple. Um, and then one of the things that Thompson does with his publisher, Samson Lowe, Marston Searle and Rivington, based on the success of illustrations of China, this great encycl visual encyclopedia, is to go down market. So they see an opportunity to reach a wider audience with a cheaper publication aimed at this l growing literate um, middle class and they produce a single book with much more text but with his photographs illustrated back in with wood engraving so the technology doesn't exist to produce multiple images cheaply in ink at this time this is 1875 um, but through wood engraving you can reproduce his images in with much much bigger print runs so there would have been thousands of copies of the Straits of Malacca, Indochina and China, which was um, the title of this book. And um, the wood engravers were incredibly skillful. So they reproduce with great faithfulness um, Thompson's photographs. And they're really the unsung heroes of, um, of 19th century publishing. And you can see the detail of the line, the kind of the tonal range that they're able to produce. Um, if you, you look in detail. So here's one of the Canton Street scenes that he took. This is um, one of the photographs in Illustrations of China and its People with the, the photographs printed through the collotype process in ink. You can, you can just about see the shadows of people. He must have had a long exposure time in this quite dark alleyway. And many people would have been walking past but just didn't stand still long enough to register um, in the emulsion. And here it is reproduced in wood engraving in, in the Straits of Malacca. Um, his greatest work, in my view, is a very, very rare book indeed, called Fu Chao and the River Min, which um, is a bit spectacular, large format book. The Island Pagoda image is from it. Um, there were, oh, I found the printing house records for it. 
um, and only 45 copies were printed. I think for the uh, British and American merchant class, who are mostly opium traders in Fuchao, and I've only been able to track five copies of this, and one of them was just burned in the wildfires of California just a few weeks ago. And this is now a very expensive book. Um, so the man who lost his entire collection, 36,000 photographically illustrated books, um, lost a very, very expensive book indeed. Um, one of the studies that made him particularly famous is this work called Street Life in London. And I think this is interesting because it was published with photographs using another pho innovative photographic process called Woodbury type. Um, but it was issued in parts. And we sometimes forget that Victorian publishing used the idea of buying a, a, just a few pages at a time each week or month and accumulating them at the end and binding them up together. And this is how Charles Dickens and other uh, literary uh, writers published their work in, in parts that you bound up. And of course, Dickens made this great his name for himself by ending each part with a cliffhanger. So you had to buy the next one to find out what happened. Um, isn't quite like that with Street Life in London. Um, and you can see they also use advertising. But you find a mixture here of Thompson's photographs of the people of the streets of London that he found in the various state, social and economic states he found them in, together with um, text uh, these are um, what he calls the London nomads, who are a gypsy family, um, with accompanying text by a journalist. So this is the idea of this as the first photojournalism. And the journalist was a, a, one of the pioneering socialist uh, journalists called Adolf Smith. And this is arguably his most famous image. And it was much remarked upon. This, this work was heavily reviewed at the time and it had a very powerful effect on communicating the states of the social and economic states of the people in the you know this golden city of empire um, where their own citizens were in these dire straits this woman um, forced to make a living by looking after the children of women who were working in the sweatshops of the clothing industry of Victorian London. And it's still in every history of photography, this image, um, along with some of his other Chinese uh, images, uh, is, is always now, always now appears. Uh, he used multiple ways to uh, circulate his images, always with a mind to the commercial opportunities. So repackaging, republishing his work uh, almost constantly. And I just want to end on this book, which I found is in the only one in my own collection, which is one of the cheaper versions of his books. And um, I liked it in particular. It's not a particularly uh, e expensive book. You can find copies. But it was given as a prize to um, Donald Stewart for regular attendance and good conduct at Tyne Castle Bible class. 1903 to 1904, so in Edinburgh. And I think Thompson would have loved the idea that this son of a tobacconist makes his fortune by traveling with a camera around the world, has this extraordinary life, and his work is being given to um, a young man at the start of his life um, as a prize. He would have absolutely loved that. And here he is one of the few images, kind of self-portraits, I think somebody must have um, taken the lid off the shutter, um, but un I'm sure under his direction. So ladies and gentlemen, I have finished just about on time. Thank you very much indeed. Richard, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a fabulous, enlightening uh, conversation or a, a discussion with us this evening. Um, I am sure that there are going to be uh, quite a few questions. Uh, before we move on to that, if I could just make a few remarks. My name is Jeremy Woodall. 
Uh, I am the Director of Development for Asia for the University of Oxford, uh, based here in Hong Kong in our, our uh, Oxford China office. Uh, we've been delighted to, uh, to help promote this event uh, together with uh, our friends at CUHK and Asia Society, uh, and we're delighted to see um, so many Oxford friends here. Uh, for those of you who do have a connection uh, or interest in Oxford, um, just to kind of put this in an Oxford context, uh, shortly after uh, Thompson left Asia uh, in 1875, Oxford appointed its first uh, professor of Chinese studies, which was quite early for Western universities, and in fact appointed a Scotsman, uh, James Legg, who was living in Hong Kong at the time that Thompson was here. So very interesting, uh, interesting connections. Uh, I, we've got uh, a, little, a little bit of time for questions. Uh, I wonder if anyone wants to start us off with questions for Richard. Like the hand in the back, actually, was the first. Uh, thank you for a, a fabulous sort of evening's entertainment. I have one query. It's the, the link between uh, Thompson's photography and the Welcome Library. I understood that the Welcome Library was more on a medical basis, and uh, I can't really fathom out why it would end up with such a large well, corpus it, of Thompson's work. Um, it's a very good question. Um, so Henry Welcome, who's, who founded the library and indeed the institute, um, and made his money as a making drugs, actually a pharmaceutical pioneer, um, was interested in everything and had gave his new library so much money that they were able to interpret the idea of medicine incredibly broadly. So they, they, would fit, they would decide that anything was medicine. So there are actually some of his photographs. Among the 2,000 or so negatives, there are probably five or six that show Chinese medical practitioners. And that was enough. That was enough excuse for them. Um, and in fact, uh, Thompson approached them in, in his own lifetime. To, to do the deal, I think to enable enough money to pass on to his children. But he actually did, died before the deal was struck and his son actually kind of closed the, closed the deal after his death. Uh, no. Great, another question just over here. Hi, thanks for the really illuminating talk. Um, it's especially interesting for me because I did my undergraduate dissertation on British anthropological photography in oh. southern and western Africa from yeah. 1880 to 1910. And I did a lot of research work at the Bodleian, the Royal Anthropological mm. Society, etc. Um, you mentioned it a bit in your talk, but I wonder if you can expand a bit about how John Thompson was maybe different from some of his peers that were working in the field in other parts of the world, um, how his approach to people was different, and if you can compare it to any other photographers yeah. that you might know of um, around the same time, different parts I, of the world. I, I mean, I think. Um, it's the range of his interests. So you find a lot of the um, the travel photographers who go, Desiree Charnay, who visited um, uh, Mexico, Central America, was only interested in the ancient ruins. And so there's a lot of photography that's focusing on the redis or the discovery in, in Western terms of ancient civilization. So there's this you know, expansion of interest in ancient civilizations. And there are lots of books which are full of photographs of, you know, particularly the Middle East. Um, so ancient Egypt and, you know, Palestine and so on. And there's also a kind of Bible interest there. So, you know, this is a, a world which is immersed in religion. We saw that that book given to a student in a Bible class. So lots of photography is driven, particularly in the Middle East, by trying to document the lands of the Bible. Um, and of course, we see that kind of photography with Thompson. He photographs old buildings. He's interested in those. But he's also interested in um, you know, daily life. What do ordinary people get up to? What are the trades that are being um, undertaken in the shops of Hong Kong or on the streets of Beijing? What do people dress like? What do brides look like? What kind of clothes do they wear? So there is a kind of ethnographic, you could argue, there's a kind of ethnographic interest or a kind of anthropological interest, but I don't think it's not the same as um, 
uh, he's not sort of deeply interested in their um, uh, sort of tribal behavior, as it were. He sees them, I think, more as not quite as peers, but he he has a degree of empathy, which sometimes you have to read the text to to get that. You don't automatically see it with the photographs, but once you see enough of them, I think there is a kind of human empathy, which you also find then in London. So he treats his subjects in London very similar to the way he treats them in on the streets of Beijing. So I think it's that range. Um, there's landscape, there's build, buildings, both ancient and modern, and there's the life of people, both, you know, high important people, as well as ordinary working class people. So he's he's just kind of omnivorous in that sense. And I think he the other difference is that he's commercial. So he sees a business opportunity. Um, he's, he has a kind of vision that these photographs can make books which will make him money and fame, I suspect, as well. Yes, thanks. Uh, there's a suggestion that he actually paid uh, people to appear in some of his photographs so that you may have a, a view yep. of Queen's Road or a particular yep. building. Yep. And then he may put a street urchin yep. or a merchant or, yep. or, or a street. And, and this adds a character. And also, it's something that maybe you can identify his work by. Yes, absolutely. He, he absolutely did that. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. Partly, it's scale. So... Mm -hmm human beings in photographs, particularly of landscapes or large buildings, help give you scale. And partly you see it because like the Canton Street scene, um, you have to pay someone to stand still long enough for them to register in the collodion. And so I don't think that's an accident that someone's just standing right at the right spot. I think he's having to either persuade them or bribe them to do it, pay them, pay them to do it. Uh, and you do see some of the same individuals time and time again, um, which is another bit of a dead giveaway, isn't it? Yeah. I think here on the on the right hand side. Do do, do wait for the microphone. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I was just curious on a couple of technical points. Could you tell me uh, what format he uh, predominantly worked in? Was it uh, say in the eight by ten range? Or? It's what's called whole plate. So it's. Mm -hmm. Um, they're larger than eight by larger 10. than eight yeah. by ten, and exactly. then the stereos, which are much mm -hmm. smaller, Wider, and sometimes yeah. only one half of the stereo will be reproduced in the books. Right, right, and uh, and and just to follow up on that, uh, on the you had mentioned the lead lined um, boxes that he uh, preserved yeah. his plates in. Was there a specific uh, reason why he chose lead, or was that just? Uh, I think it's to keep the keep the bugs and the water out. Right. Um, that, that, that would have been the typical uh, uh, means when used at that time to provide a, I, a relative I, I, feeling. I like confess, I technology. can't think of any other similar things that survive. I think mm -hmm. it's quite extraordinary that not only that he kept them, and you can kind of see why he would keep them as they, you know, they've traveled all those thousands of miles across the world, but why the Wellcome Institute kept them. And I think the Wellcome Institute didn't actually know what they, they had such vast collections that for many years they had a warehouse which just was just full of stuff that nobody knew what was there. And it took them decades to work through it and actually catalog them. Um, and these weren't really known about until the 1980s. Hi, um, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, you, you kind of touched on this when you said that um, in this age, we're saturated with with photographs. You know, um, the power of photography is literally in everyone's hand now. So I'm, I'm just curious, like uh, how you as the um, head librarian at the Bodleian in, in 2018 are um, cataloging, recording, archiving, studying um, images from today. Um, well, that's a very good where I mean, no, but you know, it's an impossible task. I think one of the things that we are doing is um, web archiving. So we do um, archive websites. Um, 
So we are part of a consortium of libraries in the UK, which are national legal deposit libraries, and we have uh, the right by Act of Parliament to archive the whole of the UK web domain. And so we take an annual crawl of every website. Um, it's now over 16 billion websites we've captured. Um, and so there's an awful lot of images in those. Um, but it's not the same, you know, the, you know, billion, there are billions and trillions of images in Facebook, um, on Twitter, and the Library of Congress archived Twitter for a period of time, but the scale of the task was too much, and they, they gave up, I think, after five years. Um, so it's, it's a massive challenge. We, we do have collections of digital images that are parts of people's personal archives. So if you think of um, uh, you know, a, a person, an individual, let's say a politician whose archive 50 years ago would have been boxes of correspondence, notebooks, diaries, photograph albums. Um, so now the equivalent personal archival collection that an institution like mine will take will be um, word processing files, email, digital images, spreadsheets, as well as some, some, some paper. And we have you know, the organizational archive, so the archive of Oxfam, for example. So we have about 200,000 photographs in the Oxfam archive, and there are kind of lateral files of um, negative, negative strips and contact sheets, but also stacks and stacks of uh, DVDs with, you know, as, as their um, commissioned photography moves from analog to digital. Um, and we get regular record transfers now, which are just hard drives. Uh, sorry, just here, right on the end. Um, thank you. I'm very curious uh, about the consumption and impact of the photos that you have shown us um, tonight, because I think you have emphasized quite a few times that uh, the photos were about working class people, but they were used for commercial purposes. So I'm interested in who were consuming those photos, why were they interested in them, and also um, why... Um, who had access to them. Yep. And then uh, also I'm um, thinking about impact as well in terms of yep. um, that would probably also be the only channel through which they understand Asia. So also sort of thinking about the talk being an Asia yep. society tonight, then yep. what does that mean in terms of their image of Asia, especially in terms of like they're portraying everyday life uh, as compared with more um, uh, um, higher life, as it were. So I'm thinking about yep. like consumption impact, whether they yep. were like orientalized or deorientalizing uh, yep. uh, processes. Well, yeah. they were certainly. It was certainly that orientalizing process was going on. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But the range of types of publication from things like the Illustrated London Magazine, and in particular, uh, an illustrated magazine which he worked with called the Graphic, which reproduces photographs as wood engravings. So that re reached a much broader audience. They were much cheaper. Um, one copy would also be circulated around a family or a community. Um, you would find them in the reading rooms that were available to um, a wider public. Um, the bigger, more expensive publications like Illustrations of China and Its People, that's really, you find that in the library of gentlemen's clubs it was expensive to buy. So it's aimed at a kind of uh, an, an educated class that are trying to understand the empire or, you know, the, 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 the areas in which, you know, trade is going on, um, who are just generally curious about the world. This is a time where um, you find the kind of mul multiplication of atlases and other travel accounts. And the, it's a very popular genre, and people are just kind of really interested in it. And the, partly there's a kind of look at all these lands that we've conquered. Um, we want to understand them. Um, but the, there is also the element of the exotic, the new, the strange. Um, but you find that, I think, more in the way that the graphic or the Illustrated London News will treat 
the images than in, say, in illustrations of China and its people, which is, I think, more kind of measured um, in, the, in its, the kind of tone of its portrayal. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. That's about all the time we have for this evening. Um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, Richard, a tremendous thanks for, for sharing your expertise uh, and, and insight into John Thompson. Uh, and more broadly, and speaking as a long-term Hong Kong resident, thank you for your work uh, traveling between Oxford and Hong Kong, sharing the treasures uh, of the Bodleian Library uh, with us uh, here in Hong Kong. Uh, and I, we can certainly count uh, the Bodley's librarian uh, as one of the great treasures of the library. So thank you very much. Thank you.